Hello, thank you for joining my presentation. My name is Santiago Kantorovic. Uh, today we're going to be talking about AES-GCM common pitfalls and how to work around them. So I've been working in cybersecurity since 28, uh, been working at Twilio since 2015. Uh, mostly, uh, I was the security officer for the authy slash account security business unit. Uh, right now, I'm a staff product security engineer. Uh, by the way, and as a disclaimer, I'm not a cryptographer. Uh, I'm just an um, enthusiast about that. So why this talk? Uh, so organizations need to implement encryption. Uh, they usually have some use case, they have some sensitive data they need to encrypt, so they decide, okay, I'm going to start encrypting. Uh, usually someone in the company, usually some engineer that may not be from security, says, I'm going to create a library, uh, I'm going to do some copy-paste from Stack Overflow of some code. Um, Ten years later, everyone is using the same library, no one is asking if it works or not. And uh, no one looks into that. Most security companies don't have cryptographers uh, or experts in cryptography. Um, and they usually rely on the engineers or if they are lucky, they have security engineers. And if they are luckier, they may know a little bit about cryptography. So yes, most companies need to encrypt and most of them are just winging it, large and small. Okay, so uh, let's assume that yeah, you need to store some sensitive data in the database. It could be API keys, PII, credit card, etc. You, you name it. Uh, someone say, let's encrypt. Uh, AGCM is mentioned a lot on Google searches. Uh, someone goes to Stack Overflow, does a copy paste, and they are done. I did a random uh, Google search about Stack Overflow, I need to encrypt some data, what should I use? And the first result is already suggesting AES-GCM. AES-GCM is very, very popular. Uh, it's usually recommended by many big organizations uh, like Cloudflare, Microsoft recommend it, uh, cryptographers recommend it, it's widely used in, in TLS, uh, so yeah. So now that you decided to implement key management, uh, so you, you oh, sorry, you have decided to implement cryptography and encryption, so you now have to deal with key management. So with great power comes great responsibility, uh, managing keys. And managing keys means going through all the key life of the key. And part, important part of key life is key rotation. And key rotations, you may ask him why we need to do that. There's many reasons we'll just go through some of them. Uh, if the keys are ever compromised, you will probably need to rotate. Uh, there are standards that enforce key rotation for several reasons that we'll also be seeing briefly. Compliance standards like PCI uh, require you to do this if you are PCI compliant. And when to do it, it depends. It could be based on the amount of years of key creation the amount of times uh, the algorithm for encrypting was invoked, or it could also be based on the total number of bytes encrypted. These are just examples. So we discuss now uh, about crypto period. The crypto period is not exactly the same as key life. Uh, so this is what a special publication from NIST say about key management and specifically about what crypto period is. So it's a time span during which a specific key is authorized for use or in which the keys for a given sister application may remain in effect. So it's pretty broad statement and they offer uh, these 14 factors that affect crypto periods. Some of them are already mentioned uh, in the previous slide. Um, we'll focus in on number seven today. Uh, I have it in the next slides a little bit larger. So limitations for algorithm usage. For example, the maximum number of invocations to avoid nonce reuse. Uh, so something also to consider, key life is not the same as crypto period. Uh, so extending the key life may or may not affect the crypto period. 
so yes, crypto preview again is not related to the maximum amount of encryptions you can perform with one key. It may be uh, subject to that restriction, but it's not exactly the same. So crypto period are usually suggested or enforced through standards like NIST or regulations like PCI. So let's quickly introduce what IB uh, initialization vector or nonce is. Uh, we'll not get into the details, just give you a little bit uh, some context about it. Uh, I'll use and usually the literature uses is this interchangeable. So it's the same in, in this use case. Um, what it's usually used for is when you encrypt uh, twice the same plain text using the same key, uh, you, if without the, the, the use of these, you may get the same ciphertext. So the idea is to add some randomness or uniqueness. So when you encrypt twice the same plain text with the same key, you get two different ciphertexts. There are other uses and we'll be touching a little bit of them, but this is just important for you to, to understand. Okay, so uh, GCM wins popularity contest. Uh, we already talked about that. It's recommended by Benny Expert. It's an uh, AEAD uh, mode. That means it has built-in authentication and integrity. Uh, so that's a good thing to have. Not many modes have these especially CVC, the mode that it replaced in popularity, what it was used to be used for older versions of TLS, uh, didn't have that built in and it had to, build, uh, had to be built in, uh, had to be built on the side for CVC. Uh, GCM is also very efficient and performant, uh, especially compared also to the, the, the previous popular mode that was called CVC. Okay, so GCM, what's wrong with it? So GCM is just basically CTR mode, also called counter mode, and with some integrity authentication check added called the GMAC. Uh, let's see what this RFC has to say about CTR specifically. Um, it says, uh, I'm starting the first line at the end, uh, an IV collision immediately leaks information about the plain text in both packets. Uh, I will see why. So this from Wikipedia, uh, there's an image that explains how CTR works. And you see that what it does, uh, like most string ciphers, it uh, applies the, the block cipher encryption, in this case AES, uh, to the nonce with the key, and the result of that is then sort with the plain text. So we'll go deep into this right now. Um, so let's assume there's a service that we sign up that gives us, for example, an, uh, an API key, and they store that API key encrypted on their site. So Plain text A is known, let's assume is my uh, API key, I'm the attacker. And also let's assume that we do a SQL injection to that service and we get uh, every customer's uh, API keys encrypted. So plain text B would be the API keys that we don't know and Cypher B would be the encrypted one that we know since we just stole it through a SQL injection. Uh, so the thing here is that we are stealing millions of keys and let's assume there's a nonce repetition. So uh, my key and another key are using, the API key are using the same nonce uh, to encrypt our API keys. So. Let's see how the service would store or encrypt my API key. So they would first encrypt nonce one uh, and then do the XOR with plain text A, plain text A being my API key, and the result is, of course, a ciphertext A. Now, uh, the service for encrypting another customer API key uh, that uses the same nonce, we'll do the same operation instead of uh, and, and soaring with plain B and getting cipher text B. So right now we know cipher text B, cipher text A, and plain text A. 
So let's do this operation. Let's do a sort between cipher A and cipher B. And that means that the, the nonsense cancel each other due to the sort uh, nature. And we get the result of that as the XOR of plain text A and plain text B. And that's what the RSC said before, that it leaks information about the two plain text. Uh, but in this case, we have them XORed. So what we can do next is XOR again with plain A. So we have the API key, it's ours, so we can XOR with that. And next thing that happens is that they are canceled. Oh, sorry, super animations. Uh, they, are, they cancel each other and we get plain B. Uh, so we see that it's pretty bad. You can decipher or decrypt uh, plain text from, uh, cipher text from uh, other services in this case. Okay, so it doesn't end here. So when nonce repeats, something else happens. Uh, and that is that the auth key is leaked. The auth key is the authentication key. It was used to create this GMAC, also called authentication tag. And if you do that, you know, and we won't get into the details, but if you if you if you if this happens, it will allow you to forge and tamper ciphertext. So this is pretty pretty bad. So I'm citing here two papers. This the, the first one I'm citing here is. Uh, practical attacks on TLS, and the second one here is uh, from the author that discovered this attack. So a single repeated nonce is usually enough uh, to fully recover the connection authentication key. And the second text says encryption mode is no longer authenticated whenever this happens. So this is pretty, pretty bad. Okay, so you may say, okay, so when I'm creating GCM nonces, I will just not repeat them and I'm done, right? And, or you could say, I'm gonna use counters. The problem with counters is that you may have a distributed uh, infrastructure, for example, a thousand instances uh, encrypting and syncing a counter between all of them is not uh, doable. Uh, so you usually need to rely on creating random nonces, and that's when problems start to arise. Something else to note is that GCM nonces are standardized to be 96 bit long. There's no reason it couldn't be longer, but that's how it was standardized by NIST. And this is also what NIST has to say about GCM. Uh, they say that the probability of, let's say, collision uh, should not be greater than two to the power of minus 32. And the total number of invocations uh, should not exceed two to the power uh, of 32. So let's keep these numbers in mind. We'll go through them many times though. So the probability of collision should be less than two to the power of minus 32, and that's around uh, 10 to the power of minus 10. We can't encrypt more than two to the third, to the power 32 times with the same key. Uh, we'll see how big is that. <laughs> uh, and we, we can't do th these two things. Uh, we, we can't do the, this second thing is because there's a risk of random nonce repetition. So imagine we have a, our organization where implementing in cryptography is encrypting 500 records per second, this is pretty common for an average size company. Uh, you will hit that number after 100 days, uh, not years, days. Uh, so this is pretty, pretty bad. Uh, so that's why it's important to, to have considerations when implemented GCM. Uh, and we'll talk uh, about that. So you may be wondering why so pro the, the, this number two to the power of 32 comes from uh, the nonce size or length uh, being too small. So why 96 bits? Why not something larger like 256 bits? And uh, the reason is also comes from, from NIST. Uh, they said is for efficiency. And you need to think that GCM was designed mostly to be in the use case of TLS where there are point-to-point -point connections and it's very easy to keep counters. Even counters are used to prevent replay attacks. So uh, in the context of TLS, this is not uh, an issue. Uh, TLS also has a rekeying function. So whenever they 
uh, deemed necessary, they can change uh, the key. Uh, yes, you could implement GCM with longer uh, lengths, uh, longer nonces. Uh, but if you do, it's not standardized. So you're going away from the standard and it's no longer, can't longer be called AES-GCM per NIST standards. And you may be saying, okay, so I'm gonna use a library to solve this problem for me, right? Uh, they probably know our experts in this, so they got my back. Uh, the truth is, it's not. Uh, most libraries just implement Bourbon uh, AES GCM, uh, and that's okay. They are not opinionated libraries. Uh, Libsodium does that. Uh, Google Think does the same thing. Uh, Libsodium, by the way, supports very uh, uh, many algorithms. When you is when using GCM, that you need to specify it. They don't have any workarounds. The limitations. Uh, I also check like uh, Golang standard library, and even they in in, in their source code of the Golden Standard Library say never use more than two to the power 32 random nonsense with a given key because of the risk of a repeat. So yeah, uh, you are not uh, solving your problems with, with this. So the, you may be asking the question, why random numbers repeat? 96 bits sounds pretty big. Random numbers in that range, as you have a lot to the power of 96, right? And the answer is, is no, and that's due to the birthday paradox. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, so birthday paradox comes from the paradox that uh, if you have, for example, 23 uh, students in a class, what are the odds of two students, at least two students, uh, having their birthday on the same day? And the odds of that happening is uh, over 50%. And when you are around 40 students, the probability is around 90%. So if you don't want to any random numbers to repeat, you must limit the amount of random numbers you generate. And for example, if your numbers go from one to 10, it's extremely likely that if you generate five random numbers, two will repeat. Um, I did the math for this using the birthday paradox formula and that is around 70%. Uh, what I also did, I went to random.org and started generating numbers. And I did these uh, four tests that I'm gonna show in a row. And in all of them, there was a repetition. Uh, I even challenged my number 70% because I was getting a lot higher, but I assume I did uh, the math well and everything is working correctly. Okay, so birthday paradox limits us the amount of encryptions we can do. The question is to how many? Uh, we see that NIST uh, for GCM recommended a max of two to the power of 32. Uh, that's around uh, 10 to the power of nine. Uh, so here we have a probability table created. I took it from Wikipedia. And in blue, you, you, you see that for 96 bits, uh, that's the size of the nonce. Uh, I, I went to the closest number I could find, uh, erring on the safe side, and I see that the probability is not to have a collision. Uh, the, colli the probability of collision should be equal or less to 10 to the, m to the power of minus 10. Okay, so acceptable probability of collision per NIST is around uh, 10 to minus to the power of minus 10. Uh, but since the table doesn't have that number, and we're using the table for further calculations, we'll say that safe is 10 to the power of minus 12. Okay, so let's go through the workarounds right now. Uh, some requirements for it. So we want to use ASGCM with no changes. We want it to remain fully NIST compliance. So we won't change anything at all. Uh, we won't change how the nonces are created. We'll keep it NIST compliant 100%, FIPS, FIPS 140 uh, slash FedRAMP compliance and allow you to go for those certifications if you need to. Uh, we will keep the probability of collision 
to less or equal to 10 to the minus to the power of minus 10 uh, per the specification. Uh, we also want to be able to at least encrypt 2 to the power 64 compared to 2 to the power 32 encryptions. Uh, we also have no requirements for these workarounds for performance and efficiency. We'll try to do our best, but that's not the core of what the workarounds uh, are going after. Okay, so let's start with the, the first workaround I'm proposing, and it's, I'm calling it random salt. Okay, so the first thing is we are going to be deriving keys, and this is encryption keys, and we'll do it from a master key. And uh, to derive, we're going to use, oh, the, by the way, so a, a way of seeing this is adding more entropy to the, the encryption. So in a way, synthetically emulating larger nonsense. And that's what we are going to be uh, trying to achieve. We won't change how nonsense are created. So what we are going to change is the households are created. Uh, it will remain NIST FIPS 140 compliant. And if a nonce were to repeat, it should happen with a different key. That's the, 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 what we want to achieve in, in, in here. Okay, so for deriving keys, and if the keys are 256 bits long, we'll use, for example, HMAC SHA 256. We'll use the master key and the salt there. Salts are random uh, and, uh, in this solution, and we need to figure out the required si size for this to comply with the requirement of being able to encrypt uh, safely up to 2 to the power of 64 times. By the way, the master key is never used to encrypt. Okay, let's calculate the salt size. Salts are random too, and when things are random, you need to consider the birthday paradox, so don't forget about this. I made the mistake the first time I was doing this uh, solution, so don't make the same mistake. So let's get back to our table and we calculate that 2 to the power of 64 is around 10 to the power of 19. And in, in, the, in, the, in the green rectangle, what I'm stating there is all the possibilities that fit in uh, that, that, possibi that, that number of 10 to the power of 19 within the probability of collisions that we believe it's safe. So we see every number there is even better. So we may even be able to achieve we, with those uh, nonsense or big, full of big, big size of entropy, uh, even probabilities better than P uh, equal 10 to the minus 18. Okay, so um, we realized that going with 192, is probably good uh, in here. Uh, we are getting, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot greater the probability than we need. Yes, if we had another table or better accuracy here, we could be able to uh, maybe determine 160 bits is good enough. Yeah, it could be. You can do the math. You want to figure out. Uh, I'm going to go with the safe side and use this table for these calculations. Okay, so we need 192 bits random in total, but we already have 96 bits from the nonce. So 90, uh, 192 bits minus 96 bits, it's 96 bits. Uh, so what we know now is the salt needs to be 96 bits long to err on the safe side, and that's 12 bytes. Uh, to create the random, I recommend secure random. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the random we use is evenly distributed and also there's no flaws in numbers repeating uh, if, when using something not secure as secure random. Um, and also, if you're going to be using several instances, and that's probably expected for encrypting using the same key, they may be cloned from each other, like uh, coming from the same image. So you want to add fresh entropy 
to the entropy pool um, when the instance goes up. Okay, so the extra cost compared to playing ASGCM is calculating or deriving 96 bits strictly random. That's pretty fast usually. Uh, you don't need to wait for the entropy pool for this. So that's pretty fast. It's doing one HMAC. That's pretty fast too. Um, from efficiency point of view, we are just adding 12 extra bytes. So it's not really bad. And of course, you can adapt this salt size based on need. You may realize that you may not need to encrypt uh, 2 to the power of 64. Uh, so you may be able to go down, I don't know, maybe to 8 bytes. But I think 4 bytes doesn't change that much in this case. So that's why I decided this is a really safe number to go to. Um, and uh, there's a link there. I coded this uh, library. And the source code is there. I did it for Golang. Okay, so let's talk about the workaround, uh, time-based salts. Uh, it's pretty similar to the previous method. What we change is how we generate salts, but it's gonna be the same uh, derivation. Oops. It's gonna be the same uh, derivation algorithm. So HMAX, SHA-256. Uh, something important here is that uh, CTR, or GCM, usually relies on counters. And uh, counters are good nonsense because they don't repeat. The hard thing is keeping sync of them. So we are going to be doing uh, some, some time of uh, counter and it's going to be based on time. Uh, time doesn't repeat itself, so that's a good thing. But of course, uh, if your generality is seconds, during the same second, uh, it repeats uh, itself. And we'll talk about that. Uh, also, something to consider, time can repeat itself uh, through different instances that may have some minimum time shift, uh, or if an instance or computer is uh, time shifted and then uh, its time is synced with MTPD, for example, it may go back to a previous time that already went through. Uh, but none of those two things uh, affect us at all. Uh, I recommend uh, if if you want to go with this solution because you don't like 12 bytes, go to with 32-bit Unix time. So that's just four bytes. Since it is not random, birthday paradox doesn't apply here. So you can actually multiply 2 to the power of 32 by 2 to the power of 32 to get the amount of screenshots you can do with this scheme. And of course, that's 2 to the power of 64, our uh, goal. Um, and yes, as long as you don't perform more than two to the power of 32 encryptions in one second, you should be fine. That's why I said uh, time doesn't repeat itself, but it repeats during one second. Uh, two to the power of 32 encryptions is like four, more than four billion encryptions per second. If you are doing that, then you probably are, I don't know, you are the NSA or some big organization uh, and you probably are not looking into my presentation. Okay. Uh, by the way, we don't need to worry about time shifts between instances because they usually end up canceling each other. And even if they, there's something here that may repeat more often than we wanted to, uh, it's probably okay since we have uh, a leeway of 4 billion plus encryptions per second. So we're probably fine. Only thing to be concerned here is if clocks are not working at all, then it's, if it's repeating the same time forever, then that's a big problem for this solution. Okay, let's talk about side effects. So you're storing the time of record encryption. So imagine the record was created encrypted. So you are leaking that timestamp of creation and that could be sensitive. For example, uh, a bank account, date of creation, or when someone was born, cre uh, record creation. So that could be sensitive. So keep in mind that this leaks information, up, could leak information about what you are encrypting. So keep that in mind. Uh, the other side effect could actually be a good one. Uh, if you are gonna be doing rotation still, I don't know, every five years or whatever, uh, you will have the timestamp there to know when a record was created uh, or encrypted actually, because uh, after 10 years, if you do rotations every five years, you will want to know again when you need to rotate it. So it's useful to have it there. Okay, 
So there are more side effects. <laughs> so Unix 32-bit timestamp are signed in. Uh, and as such, they will overflow into the negatives uh, in the year 2038. So this is not near, but if we want to create a library that will resist the pass of time, then we need to consider this. So the overflow won't break the scheme. It will just be start using time in negative or time in the past, let's say. Uh, and since there will go, still gonna be unique uh, the time, uh, so it's gonna still be useful for, for a long, long time. Uh, I did the math and it's at least uh, in 2022, at least to uh, 2106. So uh, probably you don't want to go that far into the future. Uh, things that you need to consider when asking for timestamps that may be negative, your payday system may do some weird logic. So prepare for that, do some testing. Uh, and something important, if you're gonna be using this good side effect about knowing when to do the re-encryptions uh, for rotating keys, if you have timestamps in the past, you may realize that you need to uh, every time re-encrypt them, every time you, you, every single second, because they are getting old. So make sure that your logic contemplates that you are going into the past. Okay, so that's it with time-based salts. Uh, before we end up here, we, before we continue, so the good thing here is that there's no uh, uh, secure randoms here, so you are saving that, you are still doing one HMAC, and you are using also um, just four bytes. You could also go with 64 bits timestamps, then you will be going into uh, eight bytes, you won't have the overflow problem at all. You may have more granularity since you can go into the seconds or uh, beyond the seconds, sorry, to the milliseconds, nanoseconds. So you can use that also if you want to. Okay, so let's now discuss AES, GCM, SIV. Uh, SIV comes from synthetic initialization vector. Uh, it was created by three cryptographers in 2017. They call this mode non smius resistant authenticated encryption. Uh, so it has some pros. It's resistant to nonce repetition. Uh, it's less performant than GCM, but it's still pretty, pretty good. Uh, it's available in multiple programming languages, so that's good. Uh, in their paper, they say they you can encrypt Two to the power of 64 messages of length for kibibytes. So that's pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, so the cons, still not available in every programming language. And you may say, oh, I don't care. I'm programming in Golang and I have the library in Golang. But what if in the future you need to, for example, decrypt something in another platform? Uh, and, and, and this algorithm is not available in this platform. Then you are probably in, in, in some trouble. Uh, you need to figure out how to implement it yourself. Uh, it may be prone to errors if you do it. It's not easy. Uh, my workarounds are uh, not awesome looking from a cryptography point of view, but they're super easy to implement and replicate. Um, this one is pretty hard, uh, but it's actually really awesome. Uh, something else to consider for this mode is that it's not GCM native, so it's not NIST approved. Uh, so this means it is not FIPS 140-2 or dash 3 compliant. Uh, so if you ever need to go that route or if you ever need to go Fed ramp, uh, you will require, be required this. So consider that. Uh, the cryptographer submitted uh, this mode to NIST in 2019. And as far as I know, it has not yet been uh, approved. Um, even in this mode, repeating nonsense still leaks that the plain text is the same. Uh, and that's uh, what happens uh, always when you repeat nonsense. So you could also mix GCM, SIV with the proposed solutions, the, the two proposed solutions I, I gave you before. Um, all in all, SIV is probably likely secure, uh, but it's too new. And usually cryptography algorithms require a lot of time and analysis for 
cryptographers uh, to determine that it's secure, but uh, I leave that to you to decide if you believe it's secure or not. Okay, so the question is, should we really worry about GCM collisions? We've been talking about it uh, a lot and saying it's pretty bad, but does it really ha ever happen? Um, so let's do some simulations here. So two to the power of 40 years encryptions, we know by the birthday paradox that the chance of a collision is around 50%. And if you're an attacker attacking uh, a service, you probably want 50% or more of success rate for your attack. So let's assume that we, we go for 50% in this case. So an attacker needs to capture or retrieve uh, and store in, in, and we'll assume it's 15 petabytes of records to have 50% chance success of collisions. And uh, I'll give you why 50, 15 in petabytes. So let's assume we're encrypting 30 records uh, that are 32 bytes long and we encrypt it with a tag and nonce. And uh, this is regular GCM, not my workarounds. It's around 60 bytes long. So it's not super easy. So imagine someone needing to retrieve 15 petabytes uh, without no one knowing that they're doing that. Uh, and even if they, they manage to do that, 50% uh, collision chance is at least two nonces repeat. So if only you repeat once, uh, so two nonces repeat once, uh, you will only be able to decrypt one record. So it's not that you're breaking the full scheme, right? Uh, the other th ugly thing is you will be able to forge any new record. So, or tamper existing records and store them in the database, for example. Uh, so it will depend on your threat model, uh, if you are gonna wanna accept this or not. Uh, so you decide if you wanna do this or not, these workarounds or go for SIV mode. Uh, implementing any of the MyQ solutions is pretty easy. So why not do them and forget about this? Uh, you never know how your system will be abused uh, in the future. You never know how your encryption library will be used by engineers in new ways you may have never expected them to. Uh, so that could, so keep that in mind. And yeah, so something I've seen in, in, in organizations, encryption libraries live for a long time. So I've seen libraries for more than 10 years, or maybe they change a little bit of things, but it's still the same algorithm. So next questions you may be asking is, okay, so why GCM? Isn't there anything better there? And the answer is, uh, if you want to be FIPS compliant or go for FedRAMP in the future, you probably don't have a lot of options. And GCM is one option you can go. You can also go with CVC, uh, though CVC is uh, like a minefield where you can make many mistakes, uh, there's ways of implementing it securely. Uh, the signal protocol uh, uses CVC securely, so you can definitely do it. Uh, CVC doesn't have a documented limitation of the amount of encryptions, but as usually there are practical limitations that you should be considering, and they are not that different from GCM. Uh, but yes, it's less error prone to ASGM because it has the AEAD uh, integrated into it, so you don't need to code it yourself. FedRAM requires FIPS. Uh, if you don't care about anything like FIPS or FedRAM, and you may be a startup and say, I don't care about this, but think about your company growing, you may want to have uh, the US government as a customer someday and they will require you these things. So uh, you will have to do a lot of changes if you don't start from scratch using uh, algorithms that are NIST compliant. But if you don't need those, you should probably go the, rule, the, uh, the, the road of Knuckle, Deep Sodium. They have by default used uh, different algorithms that are uh, better when it's about dance re repetition. Uh, actually, I think it, they're use, it, the default one is using this one, XJACHA 20 poly 1305. Uh, and of course, you can also use GCM SIV. 
thank you so much. Uh, I also wrote a blog post about this. There's more information there if you want to dig into this more. Uh, thank you so much.